Hello, welcome to Cark Church. Glad to be with you tonight. This is our joy to uh, have this time to share together with you. And whenever you're listening, wherever you're listening, I pray that you're having a, a wonderful time of growth in Christ. And I pray that tonight will contribute to that. Uh, you know, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I can't even count how long, 40-something, five years or something like that. But throughout that time, I'm always amazed at God's ability to just constantly reveal things, give me reminders of old things, give me revelation in the new things. And I pray that tonight will be another night of encouragement and another night of uh, instruction and revelation for us all. So I'm glad you're here with us, and we're looking forward to a wonderful night. If you have your Bible, you might want to go ahead and turn to Amos, the book of Amos. And we're going to be in uh, Amos chapter 9. And as you're turning there, our title tonight is Access Granted. So uh, Amos chapter 9, Access Granted. And Patty's going to open us up in prayer and greet you tonight. Hi, everyone. I hope you've had a good day today. But just in case you haven't, um, because I didn't have the best day, and the Lord reminded me of something we used to tell our children. It was a little song, and it went like this. Praise Him in the morning when we see the sun arising. Praise Him in the evening because He's taken us through the day. In the in-between time, when you feel the pressure growing, remember that He loves you and He promises to stay. Praise Him. So we want to praise God tonight just for who He is. So please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we give you praise for you are God Almighty. And we love you, Lord, and we want to praise you with our life and with all that we do. We thank you tonight for your word and we thank you that you've given us ears to hear. We thank you for Mike bringing the word to us, and we ask for your anointing on him. And we give you praise for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Amos chapter 9 is the verse of scripture we're going to be in tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about this idea of access granted. Um, and I think this will really be a rich time of discovery and also of revelation to us all. But as we're looking at this, I wanted to share a, a quick story with you. I remember one time I was uh, at a concert and it was with uh, Mylon Lefevre. Uh, and if you don't know that Mylon passed away this last uh, month and he his memorial service was recently held in Dallas and Mylon was a dear friend. He actually sang in Patty and I's wedding, uh, which was 43 years ago. So we've known him a long time. But I remember I was at this concert, and I, I don't remember who all was there. I think DeGarmo and Key, these are old names most of you <laughs> may or may not remember. Uh, Amy Grant was there. There was a number of people. But because of my relationship with Mylan, uh, this was at Six Flags Over Georgia, I was given uh, a pass, and it you know went around my neck, and it said, All Access. And what it basically meant, there were some passes that, went, that said Backstage. There were some passes that said Staff. There were some passes that said, uh, you know, sound crew, but my pass said all access. And that meant I could go anywhere I wanted to go. I could go into the trailer, I could go backstage, I could go to the sound booth, I could go anywhere I wanted to go. Uh, I was given all access. Now I didn't earn it, I didn't deserve it, but it was granted to me. And it, it's a great feeling to have access because access is um, something that is a uh, given to us by Christ is access granted is what we're going to talk about but it means that we have not only the capacity to go somewhere but that, that we have the right to be there and with that right that gives us grants us certain privileges uh, it qualifies us because of that well tonight we're going to talk about what that means in a really really rich way and so I want us to look here at Amos chapter 9 and we're going to look at verse 11 Amos 9, verse 11, it says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages, and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. 
that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Well, there's a lot of rich information here. And as we often talk about, you know, the, the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament, and the New Testament or the New Covenant is concealed in the Old Testament. So we see in the Old Testament, that's why I love the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament we see illustration and type. And, and picture. And in the New Testament, we see actuality and what was shadow in the Old Testament becomes reality and actualization in the New Testament. Well, so here we are looking at shadow and in the shadow and the symbol, we see something very powerful here. He says, first of all, in verse 11, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen and repair its damages. I'll raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now, you may have heard sermons before on the tabernacle of David. I'm not here really to preach so much about all that, but I want to look at the key idea, which is access granted. Okay. So first of all, this picture is a picture of accessibility being restored. He talks about the, the tabernacle of David has fallen down. He's going to raise it up. He talks about that tabernacle of David being damaged. He's going to repair it. He talks about it being ruined. He's in ruins. Now he says, I'm going to raise it up and rebuild it. Well, what was the tabernacle of David? Very quickly, let me give you a quick picture of this. In the Old Testament, after Moses uh, brought the people of Israel out. If you remember, there was a tabernacle in the wilderness. It was called the Tabernacle of Moses. And the Tabernacle of Moses was a tent. And in that tent were all of the, uh, the, the furniture and all of the uh, you know, sacrificial altars and all the tables of showbread and the, uh, the lampstands and the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And all of that was set up in a tabernacle. It was a large outdoor enclave that was uh, built to be mobile so that it could be moved from place to place to place. And when Israel came out of Egypt, they came into the wilderness. Uh, Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, and then God spoke to him and showed him this tabernacle that he wanted him to build. So he went back, and according to the specifications the Lord established, he built this tabernacle. We call it the Tabernacle of Moses. But after Israel came into the land of promise, the Ark of the Covenant did not yet have a temple to be placed in. And so there was a period of time between when the tabernacle of Moses was no longer in use and the temple of Solomon had not yet been built. And in between that time, uh, David, who had such a hunger and a desire to build a house for the Lord, uh, that David decided he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant up to the city of Jerusalem in order to build a temple for it. Along the way, you may remember this story, uh, Uzzah uh, saw that the, the Ark of the Covenant was on uh, being carried by, by uh, a cart and it fell, started to fall off. Well, Uzzah reached up to straighten it out to keep it from falling and when it did, he dropped dead because he touched the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of the holiness of God. Well, uh, David was fearful after that. And so they took the, the Ark of the Covenant, they stopped right where they were, and they put it in the house of a guy named Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom had the Ark of the Covenant in his house, essentially, for three months. And during that three months, he was incredibly blessed. Everything in his life was being blessed by the presence of God being there in, in his life. So David saw that and he decided, okay, now I want to go ahead and bring this Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. So he went and got it, but this time he took care to study how to bring it. And he saw that in the scriptures it was not to be put on an ox cart, it was to be carried by the priests. And so every six paces, 
they stopped and they sacrificed all the way up from Obed-Edom's house to the city of Jerusalem until they got the Ark of the Covenant, a picture of the presence of God, into Jerusalem. But then what did they do? There wasn't a temple for it. What David did is David built a tent for the Ark of the Covenant. That's what we call the Tabernacle of David, is it was a tent that was built for the Ark of the Covenant. Now here's the thing about the Tabernacle of David. The Tabernacle of David did not have any of the, um, the walls, the barriers that existed in the Tabernacle of Moses. In the Tabernacle of Moses, there was the outer court, and there was sacrificial altars, and then you had to go to the inner court, and then only the priests could go in the inner court, and then there was the Holy of Holies, and only the, the high priest could go in the Holy of Holies. He could only go in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was one day a year on the Day of Atonement. So there, was all the, there were all these barriers and limitations between the presence of God and the people of God. But for this period of time, which was approximately 40 years after David brought the tabernacle, brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, it dwelt in a tent. And the tent had the Ark of the Covenant in it, but none of the barriers. And in the tabernacle of David, there were sacrifices offered, but the sacrifices that were offered were sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of worship, sacrifices of prayer. And there was a intimacy and accessibility to the presence of God during that time that was unprecedented before or after that. This presence of God, when David went into the tabernacle of David, he went in and he was there in the presence of God. And there was no distance. There was no hurdle. There was no barrier between him and God. So accessibility to the presence of God is something that God prophesies that there was going to come a day when that was going to be restored. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will repair its damages, and I will raise up its ruins, and I will rebuild it as in the days of old. So accessibility was to be restored. Well, what's that picture for us today? I believe, personally, we are living in this restored tabernacle of David. I believe we are living in the days and have been really since the time of Christ, but more, even more so now, where God is trying to let us understand the depth of the accessibility we have to the Lord. In the Old Testament, the average guy couldn't get past the outer court. Only the priest could get into the inner court, and only the high priest could get into the Holy of Holies. In David's tabernacle, that barrier, those barriers were removed, and this a veil that was between man and God, this barrier, this wall that was between man and God was not there in the tabernacle of David. Well, what does it mean when God says, I'm going to restore that? It means that God's desire was always that there would not be dis distance between man and God. His desire was always that he would be an intimate fellowship with us. His de desire was always that his presence would become the very centerpiece of our lives. And when we talk about the difference between, again, us trying to live our life for Jesus as though he's far and distant away up on a throne somewhere, and we're just trying to, you know, uh, to please him with the way that we try and offer our lives up to him, versus the idea, as the scripture teaches, that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Well, I'm going to tell you this. I wrote it in my, in my uh, notes. Union with Christ is the ultimate intimacy, accessibility, authority, and ability. When I am in the very presence of Christ, think about when the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant and the symbol was in the house of Obed-Edom for three months, he was unbelievably blessed. His crops increased, his, his welfare was increased, his wealth was increased, his health was increased just by the presence of God in the symbol of the Ark of the Covenant and shadow being in his house. Well, how much more would that be true if Christ, by the very presence of the living God, is dwelling on the inside of me and I've actually become the Holy of Holies? I've actually become the temple of the Holy Spirit. I've actually become the branch to the vine of his life. Then the power of that life and the strength of his life now, that accessibility is being restored. And what was fallen down 
the, the accessibility between God and man, what was uh, in damage and in ruins, the Lord says, I want to raise that back up. I want to restore accessibility so that God and man are in union and in harmony and in oneness with one another. This was the reason why Christ came, that we may be one as he and his Father were one, he said in John chapter 17. So that accessibility is restored. But the second thing I see here is that exclusivity or exclusion then is ended. Look what he says here. He says in verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. In other words, who's going to remove this exclusion? God says, I'm going to do it. It's not up to us to remove the exclusion. It's not up to us to scale the barrier. It's not up to us to break the barrier down. God says, I'm going to be the one who breaks this barrier between us so that there is an intimacy and a union between God and man. And notice what it says over in Acts chapter 15. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is preaching. He was the first apostle, if you will, over Jerusalem the pastor over Jerusalem. And what had happened is Paul had come back talking about how the Gentiles were turning to Christ. The Jews were rejecting, but the Gentiles were turning to Christ. And after James, it says in verse 13, after they'd become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, this is uh, Peter, has declared how God at the first visit, visited the Gentiles to take them out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words the prophets agree, just as is written. Now listen to what he says. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Well, what's he saying? James was actually quoting from the passage of scripture in Amos that this was a prophetic fulfillment of what Amos was seeing in the spirit is a time when the barrier between man and God was going to be broken where man would no longer be distant from God and God distant from man but where there would be an intimate access and exclusion would be ended by the way if we were to look over at Exodus we can see that the veil in the Old Testament was set up expressly to be a division. In uh, Exodus chapter 26, verse 33, it says, And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, then you shall bring the ark of the testimony, a picture of the presence of God, in there behind the veil, and the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. So the very purpose for the veil, and this veil, by the way, was not just like a little curtain. Uh, as a matter of fact, Josephus says it would have taken ten teams of horses to tear this veil. It was so thick. Here it says that it was created to be a divider. Well, here in the tabernacle of David, there was no veil. In the tabernacle of David, there was no separation. In the tabernacle of David, there was no exclusion. Well, he speaks about this when he says that the, this is going to be the work of God. God is going to get rid of this veil. Well, how did he do it? Well, holy God, sinful man, sinful man could not get rid of this veil. Only a holy God could get rid of it. And how? Not by overlooking man's sin, but by bearing our sin, removing the barrier. The Bible says the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the wheel, nailing it to the cross in his own body. He removed that barrier so that, and by the way, when he removed that barrier, this veil in the physical, uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, the veil was torn in two as a symbol that this barrier between man and God was gone. Well, thank God that the barrier and the physical barrier is gone and that this symbol is there and that the tabernacle of David is there. But let me tell you something. It's so much more than that. Because not only is the physical veil gone, but the spiritual veil is gone. Not only is the physical barrier gone, but the spiritual barrier is gone. And not only that, we have now become the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So we're not only allowed into the temple, we've become the temple. We're not only allowed into the presence of God, we've become the dwelling place of God's Spirit. And so now the intimacy and the accessibility is far beyond our comprehension. Well, because of that, by the way, let's just look at this real quickly. Look at what it says over in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, we see what happened in the natural when Jesus died on the cross. In Matthew 27, it says here in verse 50, it says, uh, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He yielded up his spirit. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Every part of scripture means something. The veil wasn't torn from man's side up to God's side. The veil was torn from God's side down to man. And when did it happen? When Jesus cried, it is finished. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake, the rocks were split, the graves were open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. All of this happened in the natural. And it was a picture of what God was doing in the spirit. The barrier between man and God was rent from t in two, from the top to the bottom, from heaven to earth. God did it to remove the barrier between us and God, not only just for the Jews, but for all the people who would be called by the name of the Lord. So that we would know that not only can we come into the temple, but that we have now become the temple. And that Christ is actually dwelling in us. And we are the holy of holies in the sense that we are the dwelling place of God by his spirit. Man, I'm telling you, this stuff amazes me. Well, now let's go back real quick and say, okay, well, what's the consequence or what's the result of that? Well, in verse 13, he begins to talk about it. He talks about a harvest being increased. Look how he says it. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. That's a beautiful picture to me. Here's a guy out trying to sow seed. Before he can almost get the seed in the ground, they're already harvesting it. And, the, and they're catching up with him because the harvest is increasing. And the fruitfulness of this uh, season as a result of this tabernacle of David being restored becomes remarkable. And he says, And the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. So it's a picture of of a beautiful increase of harvest. And he speaks of grain and grapes. Grain is the staples, the needs that we have. Grapes are the savory part of life, the, the desires. It's this picture of just an extraordinary fruitfulness that comes as a result, what? Of accessibility being granted to us to the very presence of Christ and his life in us. Then he speaks of captivity being ended. Again, why? Because of the tabernacle of David being restored. Because of the accessibility of God and man being put back into place, that intimacy. Look what he says. I'll bring back the captives of my people Israel. So uh, fruitfulness and captivity being ended. The more I come to realize that I have absolute accessibility, the presence of the living God, because he's living inside of me. And I can go boldly into his presence to find mercy to help me in my time of need. That there's no barrier between God and man anymore. Not only physically, but spiritually, I'm in the instant presence of God. That it's like I'm, I am the house of Obed-Edom now. And the Ark of the Covenant's in here, in my spirit. And as I open my heart more and more to the realization of that greater fruitfulness and a diminishing and ultimate ending of captivity in my life. What I'm bound to, what I can't do, my lack of fruitfulness, Christ can do through me. What I can't defeat or break in my life by my strength, Christ can end the captivity. Then he speaks about a restoration. Look what he says, they will build the waste cities and they will inhabit them. Things that have fallen down, things that have been destroyed, things that I haven't been able to repair, 
when I came to Christ, man, I had so much mess in my life. You know, there was just so much confusion in my life. And I'd come out of a lot of brokenness and a lot of woundedness. And, you know, I had, a, you know, things that I was struggling with and addicted to and wrestling with. And, man, I was just a mess. But the longer that I came to understand the glory of Christ's life, the more I found that fruit started to replace barrenness and freedom kept from captivity started to replace bondage in my life. And things that were broken and didn't look like they could be repaired were being restored and being put back into place. And this is what happens when we get connected to his life and begin to realize that everything he did, he did to remove the barrier, to take away the veil, to grant us access to his presence and his presence access to our hearts. And then on top of that, there's this picture of the reestablishment. Look what he says. They will plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall make gardens and eat fruit from them. This again is a picture of a restoration of things so that not only are buildings which are inanimate things being restored but life is returning and life is being manifested uh, in the place where the tabernacle of David is restored the access is restored there's just one more thing he speaks about here which is the promises acquired look what he says in verse 15 I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Well, what was the land? The land was the promised land. And the promised land is a picture of the promises of God. All of the promises of God that he's made to us in Scripture are a, the Old Testament promised land was a picture of them coming in and, and to inhabit and to acquire and to uh, receive those promises. Well, look again, who's going to be doing this work? Am I going to plant myself in the promises of God? No, he says, I'm going to plant them in their land. And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given to them, says the Lord your God. Well, what is this, again, a symbol or a picture of? Well, what is the greatest promise? Well, the Bible says all of the promises God has ever given us are Yea, in Christ. And through him we say the Amen. So what does that mean? Every promise God has given to us becomes yes in Christ. If we're in Christ and Christ is in us, then all the promises were made to Christ. Christ is in us and he is the fulfillment of those promises by his presence in us. And then what, is, what does this tell us? It tells us I'm going to plant them in the promises, uh, graft them into the promises, if you will, and they won't be pulled out any longer. I'm going to do this work, and they're going to be placed in the land that I've given them. The way I wrote it in my notes is I'm going to plant them in their land. That means I'm going to be rooted and grounded in Christ. And as a result of that, being rooted and grounded in Christ, I'm rooted and grounded in the promises. And all the promises God ever made are yes in Christ. And what I do is say, amen, so be it. Let it be, Lord, unto me according to your word. So this beautiful picture of access being granted is such a powerful picture to me. In the end, here's what it means. Wherever you might be tonight... In your understanding I want to tell you where you are in actual relationship to Christ and his promises you may not feel it you may not yet have entered into it you may not even yet have understood it you may just now be, be beginning to hear about it but what I want you to know is God said there's coming a day we're living in that day when the tabernacle of David the place where there were no veils where there was no barrier where man and God could commune with each other in perfect harmony through praise and worship and love and relationship, that desire of God to see that restored has been restored. But thank God it's not about us going to a building or going to a tent where we can walk in and the presence of God is there and then we have to leave his presence. I thought about writing a booklet one time called God is Not a Place. 
because it's God doesn't dwell in a place. He dwells in our hearts. Matter of fact, the Bible says he's bypassed man's cathedrals to get into the heart of man, the one who has a contrite spirit and a willing heart. Well, he is now inside of you, and he's inside of me. We have been grafted into him like a branch to a vine. And as a result of that, he has planted us in the land of promise. Because the, the promise that every Old Testament promise was a shadow of is the promise of the fruitfulness, the f liberty and liberation, the, uh, the restoration that would come when man and Christ would be united by that union of life and all, all access total access to his presence his promises and his power would be given to man this is what we have do you know you got an all access pass to the very presence of the living God do you know that union with Christ is the ultimate intimacy it's the ultimate accessibility it's the ultimate authority and the ultimate ability there's nothing he can't do there's nothing he doesn't have authority over and there's nothing he wants to withhold from us that he's calling us to any promise he's given is a promise he's offering to fulfill in us if we will yield our life surrender our life and become the temple of his presence Obed Edom didn't do anything to get blessed he just had the presence of God in his life and the presence of God brought the blessing so in this closing thought here's what I want us to consider I could have a billion dollars in the bank but never know it I could have untold riches and never access it I could access it but never really understand the the, the depth of it or I can become more and more understanding that what Christ has always wanted to do in my life is he's always wanted to be my inheritance not to give me an inheritance to be my inheritance he's always wanted to be my promises not give me promises but be my promises he's always wanted to be my life the source of my life not just give me life as a separate thing from him but to become my life and and he does this by granting us access to his presence not just in geographical buildings but in the very union of our life with his own if we ever start to understand that all of these Old Testament pictures all of these illustrations and symbols and shadows are all leading us to the actual reality which is Christ himself the hope of glory Christ in us the hope of glory the man it starts to reveal untold riches and, and it'll keep you occupied for a lifetime of discovery you know tonight I find myself saying Lord I believe these are the days when you're trying to raise up again the tabernacle of David which by the way has fallen down people have allowed the veils to be rebuilt the barriers to be rebuilt they've intellectually and theologically believed that there was this great separation between them and God and that they're trying to bridge the gap by living their life for Jesus if we can come back to the tabernacle of David beyond the tabernacle of David to becoming the very tabernacle of his life and his spirit then we're in a in for a brand new adventure trust me <laughs> amen so tonight i want us to pray together and i know we've covered an enormous amount of material but i hope you you've waded through the big picture to see what's the bottom line the bottom line is access has been granted amen so let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have an all-access pass to your presence. There's no place in your presence we can't go. And by the way, your presence has actually come inside of us. Because by the virtue of that union with Christ, of that engrafted life, 
we've now become, again, branches to your vine and temples to your spirit. All these Old Testament shadows, which are so beautiful, grant us so much information and insight into the real relationship you want to have with us. Thank you that the veil has been torn in two by you and not by us. Thank you that you have planted us in Christ. We didn't do it. You've done it. Thank you that it's you, Lord, who are going to bring fruitfulness. You who are going to end our captivity. You, Lord, who are going to bring life back to the land of our hearts by the power of your presence in us. Lord, thank you in these days. Anybody who calls upon your name, uh, you have granted them access to your presence uh, in intimate union with you. Let us who have known it really know it and become uh, vessels through which you can express this glorious, beautiful invitation to anyone in the world who's looking for and open to knowing it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you all tonight. Thank God he's raising up the tabernacle of David. Amen. And it's more than a tent. Amen. God bless you. We love you all. We pray for you. We're so thankful and honored always to be with you. And uh, we want to let you know that we'll be back here next Sunday night. The Lord willing, have car, we'll preach. Uh, and we always treasure our time together. Many blessings tonight. Good night.